Hi, welcome to part five of my Volkswagen bus EV conversion playlist. In my last video, I mentioned wanting to build a 12 volt or low voltage command center for this car. Well, what you're seeing right now is a shot of my initial implementation, which is right under the hatch lid in the rear cargo deck of the bus. As I will show, this will serve as a central location for low voltage components and wiring, and it will facilitate easy troubleshooting of any issues in the EV infrastructure. So stick around for a bit and check out how I made it. All right, so I got my board mostly fabricated, but before I paint and seal it and finish it off, I wanna make sure I can install it and I've got all the holes drilled and it's ready to install before I then go and finish sanding and painting it. Well, first of all, what I did to make this thing was I got this piece of plastic from the store. What is this called? HDPE white sheet. It's a 24 by 36.1 inch sheet. And then I got a piece of quarter inch plywood. So if you look at that, you have quarter inch plywood right here. And then I've got two by two pine ribs that I've put on there. So to start out with, I took, I cut down quarter inch plywood and this plastic sheeting to 15 by 36 is the measurements. Let me just make sure, yeah, 15 by 36. And then I took the, the just the plywood and the plastic sheeting and I used a heavy duty contact adhesive and I put, you know, paired them together with that contact adhesive and let that dry. Then what I did was I then kind of dry fit it, made sure it fit, and I noticed that in the rear part of it, I had to cut these notches out. See these, these notches here? Because the rails on the upper part of the rear uh, would get in the way. So I cut those out, and then I have fixed two by two, this two by two material here. See these, these four pieces of two by two. And what I did to, because the quarter inch plywood especially after gluing it, will not be completely straight when you get it. I mean, you have to really go to three quarter inch to even get a flat piece of, of plywood at the store. But quarter inch is, is much, much more harder to find anything flat. You're not, you're just not going to. But the good thing about these pine, these two by two pine boards is they're very flat. I got the flattest one I can find and cut it up. So it's pretty flat. So what I did was in order to straighten it, I put these tube steel pieces that I had and I'll show you a picture of this in the basement, these two tube steel pieces, and I put them on e each side of the board so I could squeeze it flat and I clamped them together. Then what I was able to do is cut the, these boards to size, at least doing the, the broad side first, and clamped and glued, and then I nailed from the top with two and a half inch finish nails, clamped and glued that, waited for that to dry, and then I screwed it from the underside. Now the reason I did this is I, I countersunk these, these screws because even though it's heavy duty contact adhesive, it doesn't really hold wood and plastic together very well. It's, it's, it's reasonable, but having these screws will ensure that not only do these stay, stay on nice and tight and everything stays nice and perfectly flat, but they also will hold the laminate on, that plastic laminate. So that's the board right here. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to try to press it up against the, the top part there uh, with, with this jack thing that I have. I'll show you a picture of that. And just to hold it in while I drill the holes because ultimately what I'm gonna do is drill holes in the corners and in midpoints, probably seven all the way around. Probably three in the front, two in the back, and then one on each rear side there. We'll hold it all together. So I'm gonna go ahead and and get this pushed up with that jack, just pressed up against where I want it to be, and then I'll start drilling the holes. All right, I got these holes widened out with my step bit to 516 so that the jack nut can actually fit in there. You can see they're all loosely fit in. Now we're gonna go tighten them. All those jack nuts are installed and uh, yeah like 
because they're hanging out, you do have to grab them with pliers in order to get the, them started. But once they get started, uh, you can just drive them in and that'll anchor them in. And you can also test so you don't, you don't accidentally rip them out if you have a high torque drill. Um, just test to make sure that they're solidly implanted. Um, if, you know, so a couple times I'd, I'd be drill, you know, drilling in and seeding it, and I'd ch before I went too far, I'd check it. If I could wiggle it, still too loose, and keep going on it. So yeah, not, that wasn't too bad. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and dry fit the board just to make sure that everything lines up. So I, if I have to drill the holes out a little bit bigger to make wiggle room for the, for the screws, I'll have that. All right, so I got this pretty much fit. So those little plastic spacers holding about a half an inch gap in here and it's bolted through. So let me look at it from the top. There it is from the top. Looks pretty good. So here we'll have an update on our command center board. And as you can see, I've got it sealed and painted. I put a couple coats of uh, primer sealer and a couple coats of paint. I also went ahead and drilled out some one inch holes, two more in the back. So we have four places to run cables out in the back and then two in the side here to run some cables out the side. You'll also notice that I have this guy right here, that's actually mounted through the bottom. This is a battery cutoff switch, and I figured that's gonna just hang down there, and this is one of those battery cutoffs where you put the little key in, and it can turn the battery uh, on and off. And the reason I like that is because, and basically I just did a cutout, and it fits perfectly inside this quarter inch plywood here. What I like about this is it provides a little bit of strain relief, so if I go out, I've got this like 3 8 uh, ca this cable here that I'm going to cut up and put some more terminal terminals on. Well, I can go ahead and run it right off of here and run it out and that way this will provide kind of the strain relief if anything knocks against the positive cable and then I can run uh, a second cable from here to the terminal block, that positive terminal block. So that's installed. I've got a couple of these LED lights, one's a thin one and then one's a kind of fat one. I found this at, at, at an um, auto store. And they're both 12 volts. No switches on them, but I'm, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mount this one into the inside here, and then mount this one on the underside and have a switch run to them. And that way, I'll, I'll wire it to constant power and I switch it on, I can switch these lights, and this light will glow this area here, and then this light will, will light up below it in the engine area. So that will be a nice little feature. And so what I need to do now is just kind of lay out all the components here. You see I've got these fuse panels and things like that and the terminal strips. <clears throat> Likely what I'll do is I've got my positive and negative terminal strips here. I'll probably put them like around here and the only things I need to anchor all the way through obviously are the battery terminal lug, anything that's gonna have maybe some stress or some large cables on it. So these will be bolted all the way through and probably the rest of everything can just be screwed in, you know, like these things and relays and fuses can just kind of be screwed in from the top just with like little quarter inch wood screws. So I'm going to go ahead and try to uh, do my best to organize this. I want to do as much as I can inside because the temperatures have fallen drastically and it is very, very cold right now. So as much as I can get done on the inside, I will but I won't be able to do all the cable drops until I install it because I really want those to be measured a little more accurately. I'm gonna go ahead and install that and bring you back in once I have a good uh, layout. And here it is in progress. I think I've got about as much of the wiring and component install done as I can being inside without being in the car. To start with, I got out all of my stuff. I've got like a hundred drawer cabinet that's as tall as me in my basement that has a hundred of these drawers and I keep all my parts as organized as I can. So, and I keep as much stuff as I can. So ring terminals, spade terminals, female terminal disconnects, 
everything from 22 to 18 gauge, 16 to 14 gauge, and even 12 to 10 to 12 gauge, and then plus I've got ring terminals that go from 10 gauge up uh, down to 4 gauge in different sizes. Uh, sheet metal or wood screws, sheet metal screws, um, machine screws, you know, all that stuff, and just tons and tons of wiring. I have a whole box of wires. I made a small dent in it, but I just keep everything I can and strip anything I throw away of, of good, useful wires or hardware, and that's how I'm able to collect all that, and it doesn't cost as much. All right, so let's go over a little bit of what I've done here. So first of all, if on the back side, I've mentioned that I installed that battery disconnect, but I also installed this little LED dome light and popped the wires up in a little hole up through there. The only two things that are bolted all the way through are the terminal blocks, the distribution blocks. So that is actually bolted all the way through because they probably have the most heavy-duty cables on them. Everything else is just screwed in and it seems to hold it down just fine. If you have any questions about these things, as, where you, as far as where you can buy them, there's links in my Part 3 video. The only item that I didn't um, provide a link to is this, and this is a little bit new and I just decided to add it into here. This is a Schumacher SC1300. I'll provide a link in this video for this. It's a one and a half amp battery maintainer and it's for the 12 volt battery. So the idea behind this is if you store your car, for example, my last EV was a, was a Triumph Spitfire and I had to store it because I had no way to charge the lithium batteries in the winter time when it got below freezing, basically below 30 degrees you're not supposed to charge lithium batteries. So I would essentially put it away for two and a half to three months. And even though I would disconnect the, the, the main battery pack and I had a, a disconnect for the 12 volt pack, similar to here, even still disconnecting the batteries, I had to just hope that for two or three months that you know nothing bad would happen, right? I'd, or I'd have to just lift up the hood and put an external battery, you know, charger on it and go out there and check it every so often. Well, if I store this car, this little device here, and I think it was only about $35, this will help out with that. It'll be, just be an onboard battery maintainer such that I can use it to just plug in the car. And I'm hoping that I uh, can just chop this off and run this into my J-plug box and, and basically just plug, leave the car plugged in. The charger on the main pack will be turned off and I'll have the, char the, the main pack disconnected. So the only thing that would, would stay alive is this and I can leave the BMS active on this battery, on my 12 volt battery, so that it's monitoring the main pack and making sure nothing bad goes there uh, while this is keeping topped off and maintained during those winter months. So, so that's going to be very helpful. If this isn't like going to be your, your EV is not going to be your daily driver, I would recommend the same kind of setup. All right, well, let's talk about wiring. In my part three video, I went kind of over this whole schematic with you guys and showed you all of the pieces of it. Let's see it a little bit of it in action now. Okay, so we have a couple terminal blocks here. I've got an, a 10, uh, pin terminal block and a six pin terminal block. I got my negative distribution block, my positive distribution block, a couple relays, 12 volt relays, and then a couple fuse blocks and a large 40 amp fuse. This is for the DC to DC converter. We've got the battery positive will go, I, I drilled a few holes in here, as I mentioned, battery positive will come in through here, through the disconnect, the maintainer will be on this side of the disconnect, so even if the disconnect is, is uh, open, this maintainer will still charge the battery, and then it's tied to the ground terminal as well. And here's our ground. Now, I told you that this is all gonna be low voltage, and I don't mix low and high voltage. This will be the one kind of exception here where I do run, I will run 110 volts into this cord, but other than that, everything here is gonna be low voltage. I mentioned this cabling, this is eight uh, cables 
that's going to be run under the car, and that's going to be a separate video on that. And that's going to come in through here, as well as the main battery positive that goes to the front of the car for the front fuse block. That'll go into, or these wires will mainly go into here. So what I've done to try to document and organize this stuff is I've drawn out these two terminal strips here and what's all going to be involved in them. So this is the bigger, the longer one here, the 10 terminal strip. I'm, I labeled it A, so this will just be A1 through A10. So you got these all documented here, and these could change, but the first one, two, three, four, so these four are going to be for the throttle coming from the front of the car. Now that throttle cable was actually, then that's a Hall Effect throttle cable from that Toyota Prius pedal, and it's actually a six conductor cabling. Now, a Hall Effect only needs three conductors. It needs three wires. It needs a five volt positive, a five volt negative, and then a Hall Effect out. And what the Hall Effect out is, is a zero to five volt signal that indicates the throttle position uh, based on that negative. So you got, you're feeding five volts in and you're getting it somewhere between zero and five volts depending on the throttle position out of it. And what it did is it had two redundant Hall Effect sensors, so it would send a complete set of redundant wires, these three, five volt positive, negative, and the, the Hall Effects out, and, and, and it, was, it was twice, so there'd be six wires, three of them twice. What I decided to do some, to save those wires is just double the five volt um, positive and negative, just, just send one set up, and then get back both Hall Effect sensors. So I still retain the redundancy in the Hall Effect sensor, but I'm not sending two redundant five volt positive and negative wires. So that saves me two extra wires there. Then key switch will be when I turn the key on in the front, that'll send 12 volts to here. A reverse switch, that's future thing. I don't know if my controller will can do reversing, but if it can, I will probably put another push button switch in the dashboard to reverse so that I can literally let the motor reverse so I never have to use my reverse gear on the transmission. And then a controller start button. My controller is kind of weird in that it's not just a key, it, it does ask for a key switch, but it also has a, another thing that's a start button. I could probably have just wired that the same to the key switch, but I decided to put a start button in the dash to where you turn the key on and then you also push a start button in order for the controller to go. So it's a little extra safety feature. Then I have one open uh, cable end, and you might say, oh, that's not a lot of open. What if, what if you, you know, upgrading in the future? Well, I still haven't really tapped into any unused wires out of the stock harness so I can still use those, plus I'll have this one open as well. Now, the last two terminals aren't going to be part of this eight conductor cable that's in the front. The last two are just hel helpful for things I'm gonna be doing. So this terminal A9, and you can see I've already got that wired up, and I'll show you that in a moment. That's gonna be our uh, key switch indicator for our controller. And then the other one's gonna be a future speed sensor. If my controller can do speed sensing and RPM, like basically RPM sensing for a tachometer, I'm going to get that into here. I'm just not sure if, I, uh, if, if it is capable of that, but I, I'll wire up a speed sensor. Okay, so most of that is gonna be populated from the front wiring. And then for this block here, I'm gonna have, this one's unwired and open, this one's for engine bay lights, this one, reverse lights and brake lights, so these two here, I plan on tapping off in, uh, the rear tail light, the reverse and the brake light. And the reason for that is, for the reverse light, if I can do a reversing switch, which would, this would probably uh, just close a relay that I'll have to add on here, if, that's, if I can do that, I'll use that relay to give this 12 volts. Uh, reverse lights, 12 volts. The reason for that is if you put the transmission in reverse, you get 12 volts to the reverse lights and the reverse lights glow. But if I'm pushing a button to do reverse and I'm in third gear, I also want the reverse lights to glow. So that would be using a reversing switch with a, with a control relay and putting 12 volts in through here would, would light up the reverse lights. 
the brake lights is very, very future. While I'm running a reverse light tap off that, I might as well just run a tap on the brake lights. And this would be way future if I ever get an AC controller with braking regen. And if I'm doing a hard regen, I might want to do the same thing and apply 12 volts into the brake lights, even though I'm not actually pressing the brake pedal. Then these two are going to come from the charging box. This one will be, and we talked about this a little bit on, on video three, where we talk about our AVC2. When the, when the J plug is, is, port has a plug in it, it's going to initiate a relay. That relay will use to tell that, that the car is plugged in will be part of our circuit where we turn off the control or we don't allow the controller to start up. So that's part of our KSI circuit and I'll show you that in a minute. The charging is something I added. What I may do is put a 120 volt relay inside the charging box so if it senses there's any voltage coming in. So being plugged in doesn't mean you're charging. Charging means you're actually getting voltage into the car, AC voltage into the charger. And I might put a relay on in the charging box that will tell me that with a 12 volt positive signal that we are in fact charging. What I can then do with that is tap off this terminal that 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 has 12 volts to it, and I can make like um, I can either send that back to the open maybe this open here and then go up to the front of the car and have a blinking light showing indicating that I'm charging or you know put a blinking light or charging light indicator in the fuel door area so I can do any number of things with that so that's all the terminal strips now what I currently have right now since most of the wiring is not in here so I'm gonna install this next and then I can finish out the wiring but I do have and what's this one this is the key switch so when the front comes in and you do the key switch, this will have 12 volts applied to it. That goes over here for the, to this power relay. We talked about this in part three video. This is the power relay that's going to enable this whole fuse block to energize, right? So the way the relay works is this, this is the positive on the coil, and here's the negative on the coil. And what we'll do here is will take the voltage that's that's going into the this common right off the battery positive terminal and then if this coil excites it's going to close this and then allow this to have the voltage so this this whole fuse block is is 12 volts but only when the key switch is on otherwise it's off this one on the other hand is hardwired directly in this will be any uh, this is a six fuse block and it'll have any circuits that need to be on constant battery power. Like the AVC2 in the charging box will come off of this and the controller, one of the controller B positives needs to be on battery power as well. So that's what, that's what that does. What's also nice about this particular one is it has a set of ground terminals to, to extend that. That way I can run some grounds you know, closer to it without having to tap all the way back over to here. So that's kind of nice. If we look at that, that key switch circuit, we've turned this thing on here, and I've just got a 5 amp fuse here, and now we can put 12 volts into this output here. Well, that output is actually going into the common of this relay. Now, this is our safety interlock relay that um, will turn off our controller if we don't have the key switch on, or we're wrecked, or we're, we have the charging port plugged in. Well, the way that works is, I told you that this, this is the J plug, this terminal here is the J plug, and this will put 12 volts in here if it's plugged in. If it's plugged in, this gets 12 volts into the, the relay coil. That will excite the coil, but notice that instead of wiring to this top post and then for normally open, I'm wiring to normally closed, which means this circuit is completed with the common on this terminal here. And when this, when, if the thing is plugged in and this has 12 volts and this relay closes, it actually closes to this one, which is empty, meaning it opens it. So that's what we want. When the latch gives us 12 volts, the, the latch on the J plug, that opens this circuit and doesn't and no longer completes it. Well, where is this going? So where this is going is out to here, to these to the to this thing right here. 
That's going to be where my inertia switch is wired to. So the inertia switch wiring is just two prongs, and this is just a switch. It's either open or closed. So it goes in through here and out through here. So as long as this, the, there's no voltage, meaning we're not plugged in, this is closed, and as long as we're not wrecked, this is closed, therefore we can go all the way in and we're providing the 12 volts from here to here. And that's what's going to be going into the controller ultimately for the KSI. I've started making some, and this won't be for this video, but I started making some wiring diagrams for the contactor box and the charging box. There will also be the throttle, the throttle wiring will come off of here, probably go through this hole. The contactor, this contactor box, this is going to be an eight prong plug. I'm going to use six and leave two open. A lot of that stuff's going to go to here. And you might ask, well, why would you be providing all these things when a lot of this stuff goes to the controller? Well, the reason is because the controller's harness, that 10 uh, prong harness, has a couple high voltage cables for the pre-charge circuit and a contactor control wire that has to go into the contactor box. So I figured this will be a pigtail to the um, con to the contactor box, and then from the contactor box, I will pigtail that. I'll, and a lot of these will be forwarded to that, but I'll pigtail that with those other three wires, and that'll go to the controller. So everything's unpluggable and maintainable. A few extra items here. This big old fuse, this 40 amp fuse, is wired directly into the positive terminal block here and ultimately to the battery because that's the DC to DC converter. That will be coming in through here. A big 8 gauge red cable will be coming into here from the DC output of the DC to converter, which will go through this this here, which is nice is because it's it's actually I can I can um, switch it off through here as well. It's like more like a circuit breaker than a fuse. And then we can go to here and then the other wire can just go to here to a, to the ground or to the battery negative. So the DC, that's the DC to DC converter input that's going to be coming through here, as well as probably the throttle cable going to the controller will be coming out of there. What's going around here, not only will there be the inertia switch on the side here, but I'll also have a set of gauges here. And these are just some gauges that I have. They're kind of cheap, but I may replace them. But we've got a vacuum gauge, which I'll have hooked up to my vacuum thing, and a voltmeter. There's three wires I'm going to run to these things right here. And uh, one is the lights, one is a volt, and the volts will come off of a, a fuse block right here, the voltmeter, and then another is a ground. Now for lighting, uh, and this will be kind of the final thing, I've got the lighting on a constant, just a fi little 5 amp fuse here, and I've got these two wires just kind of hanging off here. What I figured I'd do is there's going to be a little bit of a, a, like a half inch gap here, and I figured I put like a little switch on the outside, like right here. And I'll show you that when I install that. And that will switch this on. So that goes from here to this block here for my lights. And this splits off. And this goes into both of these lights. This light here, the light underneath, and to the, the back lighting of these gauges. So basically when I switch this on, it'll turn this LED light on, the under the underside LED on for the engine compartment, as well as the uh, back lighting for these gauges. Hope you can appreciate the conditions I'm working in. It is very cold today, but I wanted to get this video done before Christmas, so it's out the door. So here is the installed command center here. I got my gauges put in. I don't have the tubing yet put onto there. It's just been too cold. I don't want to break it. So once it warms up, I'll, I'll connect that tubing. Got my little switch here for the lights. Here's a light, got the battery turned on. I went ahead and mounted my inertia switch on the front here because on the sides I could have made it work, but it would have been very difficult to change out if I had to uh, switch it out for a new one and that is a kind of a cheap one so I want to make sure that was easy to maintain so here's what the engine cavity looks like now and when you look in it does cover up a bit of the controller but it kind of gives it a clean look I also might redo this panel eventually I kind of screwed it up up here when I tried to kind of put it in there but it fits nice up into these little existing kind of 
uh, I think those were for that that hardboard insulation thing. And so that fits up nicely in there and I just screwed it into the wood. Yeah, so I got the battery hooked up. I've got it on my own maintainer since I don't have the Schumacher plugged in yet, just so I could test everything out. All right, here it is from the top. Again, it's not completely wired, but I did put on some of the throttle wiring. Don't pause the video and, and write down these wires if you're following along and doing this with the same products because I'm not quite sure about the throttle wi wiring. This is my best guess, but I will test it later when I have the controller able to turn on. I ran the inertia switch out this side. You know, obviously I haven't loomed any of the wiring yet or cleaned it up because I still have a lot of more wiring to come in to here. But uh, I got a lot done. I got the con uh, DC to DC converter inputs brought in. So we have you know, the main positive and the negative going to the uh, main uh, terminal block. I've got, you know, like I said, I got the throttle cable wired up and it's going out and into the throttle for the controller. And I also have the vacuum pump wired up, which is going out there, which is just this 15 amp fuse right here and a ground. But you can see now what the advantage of this is, is I could just take the panel off from inside the car and notice all I did was I took one of the little plastic nuts off the top of the terminal, the negative terminal block. And for example, if I just wanna see, okay, what's, what's happening right now is do we have, for example, power coming in, right? So I can just test right here. Yes, we have power coming in. Do we have power going to our constant power block? Yes, we do. So I can check, you know, uh, the you know the fuse at the fuse, or I could check it on the main block. Do we have power coming into here? Well, no, because the lights aren't on. But I can also just put my sensor on the positive here and see that, no, we don't have that on because we need our key switched on. So I can simulate that and test everything out from there. But yeah, that's pretty much what, where I wanna show you for this video. And in future videos, when we wiring up the charging harness and the, con the contactor box harness and the front cabling, That'll all go in there, and once I get all of that in, I'll do a final shot of this. But this is this is it for this video. Well, before I sign off, I just want to show you one of the other features that I did in here, and I got to, I can at least show that off, and that is the lighting switch. So there it is. I love that light. I'm glad I picked that light. It lights it illuminates the entire engine bay, bay area. I love it. And this other one does a decent job of at least giving a little bit of light in there. It doesn't spread it very far though. Maybe I'll replace that later with something more directional. And then one of my gauges, my vacuum gauge backlighting is not working so I need to figure that out. But yeah, that's pretty cool. Well that about wrap up the video and hopefully I'll be able to get this out before Christmas Day. I'm going to go back inside before I freeze my butt off, but you guys have a happy holidays, and we'll talk to you in the new year.